So we have seen in the first lecture the uh, model of global cascades introduced by Duncan Watts. In this lecture, we will see how this model can be used to understand uh, financial contagion in interbank networks. So financial networks, or at least the types of financial networks that we are going to consider in this, uh, in this lecture, are networks where nodes represent financial institutions, such as banks, and links represent relations between these institutions, for instance, interbank loans. And shocks can propagate between connected banks, for instance, because of counterparty default contagion. Now, of course, there are different types of connections that can, that can exist between uh, financial institutions, but um, for now, let's just consider the example of uh, loans. So if a bank lends money to another bank and the second bank defaults, then this is a problem for the first bank because it will not recover, at least not in full, the amount that was lent to uh, the defaulted bank. So, basically, in this model, or in this, uh, uh, in this contagion uh, mechanism, uh, stress can propagate from uh, borrowers to lenders, and then to the lenders of the lenders, because typically a bank is both lending and borrowing at the same time in the interbank market. So, basically, we are interested here in understanding when the initial default of a node or of a group of nodes can trigger a cascade of defaults. So here is the analogy with the model of Duncan Watts that will become more precise in a moment when we will uh, define the uh, condition for a bank to default. So this is a style, uh, our stylized representation of a bank. It's given in terms of its balance sheet. Uh, so the balance sheet uh, of a bank is divided into two sides assets and liabilities. Assets are, for instance, so are uh, uh, contracts with a positive value. Uh, so, for instance, investments in uh, stocks, bonds, so the investment portfolio of a bank. Uh, interbank assets, so all loans that have been, uh, or money that has been uh, lent to other banks also appear in the uh, balance sheet as an interbank asset because it has a it's a contract that has a positive value because the, uh, uh, the borrower has to pay back a certain amount in the future, so it has uh, a certain value. On the liability side, we have, again, interbank liabilities. These are uh, loans that were uh, taken from other banks. Uh, and external liabilities might be, for instance, uh, uh, money that is raised through deposits or, uh, in general, any any type of debt which is outside of the uh, of the system that we are modeling as a network. So there is a, an identity which is uh, known as the balance sheet identity, which is basic accounting that tells you that assets are equal to liabilities plus equity, and that's basically the definition of the equity. But the equity is uh, the uh, amount of money that is owned uh, by the bank. So, and in particular, it is acting as a buffer to absorb shocks because the balance sheet identity must be valid at any point in time. So, if there is, imagine that there is a shock that hits the uh, uh, investment portfolio of the bank, which is devalued by a certain amount. This shock must be reflected into the liability side. And uh, in particular, it is reflected into a reduction of the equity. So the equity is the difference between assets and, uh, and liabilities. So in the first instance, shocks are absorbed by the equity, which is acting as a, uh, a buffer to absorb, uh, to absorb losses. Now, of course, uh, if a loss is too big, it might be larger than the equity, uh, and so uh, the equity is not enough to uh, to repay to absorb the shock, and this means that even by selling the entire um, investment portfolio, the bank would not be able to repay its creditors. So this uh, defines the condition of insolvency of a bank that, in the following, would be used as a proxy for default. So basically, there is a threshold for banks to default, which is given by the equity. So banks can sustain a loss which is smaller than the equity. 
a larger loss triggers the default of the bank. And that's uh, maybe the analogy with the model of, uh, with the linear threshold model of Duncan Watts is, uh, is clearer. So we, of course, are going to consider a network of, uh, of balance sheets that are interconnected between them. Um, so the network will represent the web of contracts between, uh, between banks. The connection represents a loan, so um, it will connect a borrower to a lender. A link will connect uh, a borrower to a lender, to its lender. So a liability, a, a, yeah, a liability, interbank liability to the corresponding interbank asset of the lender. So let's see a bit more in detail the relationship or the mapping with the, uh, the model of global cascades. So let's assume bank I as KI counterparties. So that's the uh, degree of bank I or the out degree of bank I and lends uh, a total amount QI to, uh, to its counterparties. So this is uniformly uh, this amount QI is uniformly spread acro across counterparties, that's a simplifying assumption, uh, such that uh, each counterparty receives an amount QI divided by KI. So now if we write the balance sheet identity, uh, we write it as the equity being the assets minus the liabilities, so the equity of bank I is its external assets plus its interbank assets, so the interbank assets of bank I are the sum over J of AIJ, that uh, AIJ is the adjacency matrix of the network, so we are uh, summing only over the counterparties of bank I, uh, times the amount that was lent to that specific counterparty. Now, to, we, we lend, or bank I lends QI over KI to each counterparty, so say, uh, the sum over J of QI over KI times AIJ is the total value of interbank assets for the bank, which is equal to QI, minus uh, LI, which are the liabilities, both interbank and, um, and external. So we assume that a bank defaults if its equity becomes negative, so we have a binary variable associated with each bank, sigma i is equal to 1 if the bank has defaulted and is equal to 0 if the bank has not defaulted. So the assumption here is that the consequence of a default is a, a, a loss for the creditors, which is equal to the amount that was lent out. So if I lend money to someone and this person defaults, uh, the assumption here is that I, I do not recover anything of, of the money that I lent out. It's a strong assumption, it can be relaxed, but let's take it for simplicity. So we assume in the following that uh, external assets and liabilities are constant, so uh, AI external and LI do not change over time, and losses can only occur because of the default of uh, the counterparties of a bank. So the loss associated with bank I is just a sum over its counterparties, over its defaulted counterparties of the amount that was lent to them. So in this case, it's a sum over J of QI over KI, which is the amount that was lent to any counterparty of bank I, times AIJ, which is the element IJ of the adjacency matrix, so we are just summing over the counterparties, times sigma J, because we are just summing over the banks that has, have defaulted since we are computing the loss. So if this quantity, this loss, is larger than the equity of the bank, then sigma i becomes 1 because the bank uh, is in default, otherwise sigma i is equal to 0. So this is the dynamical rule of, uh, uh, that defines the, the model. So if we now define phi i as the ratio e i over q i, we can see that this dynamical rule is the same rule that we had in the model of global cascades that we discussed in lecture one, the one by Duncan Watts. So the model, the, the mapping is, uh, is really there. The difference, of course, is that now links have a direction because they uh, connect uh, borrowers to lenders. So um, 
the problem here is the one of finding uh, the condition for the existence of cascades on a directed network. So uh, Guy and Capadia, in their paper that was published in 2010, have considered this case uh, of, uh, of contagion in financial networks for the case of Erdos-Reni random networks. So generalizing the work of, of Duncan Watts to this, uh, to this context of interbank, networks of interbank lending relationships. So a useful concept uh, is that can be used to, uh, to characterize the risk associated with each bank is the one of leverage. So leverage is just the ratio between the assets and the equity of a bank. So what is the idea here? The idea is that a bank has a certain amount of equity, then it will borrow some money from external investors, and then, uh, like depositors, other banks, and so on and so forth, and then it will use both its equity and the money that was borrowed to build an investment portfolio. So, uh, so that's the practice of leverage, and there is a, a quantity that is what we will call leverage in the following, which is the, uh, defined as the value of the assets divided by the equity. And this is closely related to risk because one can prove that, easily show that a 1% devaluation in the portfolios, in the assets of the bank, correspond to or translate into a lambda percent loss at the level of the equity. So if my equity is, uh, sorry, leverage is 10 to 1, that means that a 1% uh, or a 1% uh, devaluation of my investment portfolio will cause a 10% loss for me, for my equity. So a 10% devaluation will be enough to drive me bankrupt. So if we look now at the uh, threshold that we have just defined, which is the, the, the ratio between the equity of the bank and the amount of money that was lent by the bank, this is essentially a, uh, the inverse of a leverage, and it's the leverage associated with the interbank loans, because it's not the, uh, the entire investment portfolio that we are considering, but just the... Uh, the part of the portfolio of, of the assets associated with uh, uh, interbank loans. So the threshold is basically uh, in the um, in the linear threshold model is basically related to one over leverage in financial terms. So one can of course now um, apply similar uh, similar uh, techniques to the ones we have applied, uh, used last time to uh, compute the condition for the existence of large cascades in the network and one can derive the condition for, um, for the occurrence of these cascades in the case when there is a, a one bank, for instance, that at the beginning uh, has defaulted. Of course, the overall behavior of the model is quite similar to the one that was observed in undirected network. So here is a plot taken from the paper uh, of Guy and Capadia. They looked at Erdos Reni uh, directed networks. And the crosses here represent, so these are results from numerical simulations, and they represent the um, probability of observing a global cascade. So this probability has this non-monotonic shape that we have already commented last um, in the last lecture. So when the average degree is very small, so this quantity is, plot, is plotted uh, as a function of the average degree, when the average degree is very small, uh, so this is indicated by the, blue, uh, the green circle, then the network is, is poorly connected, so there is no giant component, so it's just a collection of small components that are disconnected between them. So contagion cannot take place at a large scale just because banks are, uh, are not really connected between them. Then as we increase the average degree, it means that we increase the, uh, the number of counterparties uh, in the system, 
or, relation, or landing relationships in the system and then it means that uh, at some point a giant component emerges and contagion can actually spread throughout the system and that's why the probability of obser observing a global cascade becomes non-zero and then eventually as we keep increasing the average degree uh, well we keep increasing the number of counterparties of uh, on the average number of counterparties for banks and this number is related to diversification right because if i uh, if i lend the same amount of money to uh, one person versus 10 persons of course i am more um, I have a, a smaller amount of risk in the second case just because I am spreading my investment across more counterparties. So if one of them defaults, I, I lose less. So the idea here is that when we have a large number of uh, counterparties, or the, the average number of counterparties is large enough, basically banks are well enough diversified and they are robust with respect to the, uh, the default of one of their uh, one of their uh, counterparties. So this is uh, equivalent to say that we have uh, only a small number of vulnerable nodes in the system. So this would be vulnerable banks. So the behavior is exactly the same as in the previous case. The interpretation is a bit more uh, financial, but the behavior, the mechanics of, uh, of the model are pretty much the same. Now, as we... Uh, as we did for the for the case of of undirected networks, we can compute on top of the uh, probability of observing a cascade. We can ask what is the size of cascades, given that there is a global cascade, and this is shown by the dots in this plot. Again, we observe this uh, monotonic behavior, and we observe the existence of a, a region close to a second phase transition, say. Uh, in, in the regime where banks start being well diversified where we have a very small probability of observing a global cascade but then we have that the entire system uh, is brought down by the initial default of a bank whenever contagion is, uh, is able to, uh, to take place. So Guy and Capadia uh, refer to this as a robust yet fragile behavior because there's a prob low probability of observing a cascade, so or a global cascade, so the system is somehow robust. But on the other hand, it's fragile because there is a, a so the entire system is affected whenever a cascade, a global cascade occurs. This is the effect of leverage, increasing leverage, which basically means reducing the uh, threshold. Uh, of uh, for the activation threshold, so that the threshold for reducing the capital buffer of banks, which is equivalent to reducing the threshold in the uh, in the model of Duncan Watts, while increasing leverage makes the system overall more unstable because it uh, increases the probability of observing contagion and it increases the uh, contagion window, which is this intermediate uh, regime for the average degree when the uh, system displays a non-zero probability of observing a global cascade of defaults. So one could also, we, we have seen uh, both for the, um, for the case of undirected network as well as for the case of directed networks, that uh, we, we have seen results in, for, for adversary random networks, but it can, it's possible to, uh, to derive similar, to generalize these results to the case of scale-free networks and uh, it is possible also to uh, to compare the robustness of scale-free versus adverse friendly networks and okay the result is maybe not unexpected given um, given the uh, the feature of scale-free networks that are characterized by the existence existence of a few hubs very well connected nodes so in the case of scale-free network, if we consider the initial default of a bank, of a random bank, selected with uniform probability, then the scale-free network is more, uh, more robust than a random network. And that's basically because uh, it's very unlikely that a hub will be selected 
uh, for um, by chance uh, with uniform probability uh, but it is quite likely that uh, a, a node with a small number of uh, of links will be uh, will be selected so this node somehow will uh, will impact on a smaller number of uh, of uh, creditors on the other hand if the network uh, sorry if the um, if the default involves one of the uh, of the hubs, so if there is a bias uh, for the initial shock to be targeted towards highly connected uh, borrowers, then the scale-free network becomes more fragile, and then that's basically because the highly connected borrowers will impact on a large uh, number of uh, uh, of creditors. So uh, it's uh, it's quite easy to trigger a global cascade in this case. So. This is somehow related to this um, idea of some banks being too interconnected to fail, where too interconnected to fail means that uh, if they go down, they, they will cause a significant disruption into the, into the system. So, so far we have considered uh, contagion due to interbank loans. Uh, everything can be generalized to uh, other types of uh, relationships within banks, but what we um, what we have done is to look at direct connections between banks, like connections between uh, two banks that are related to a contract that was um, uh, that was issued between the two. In the specific case we looked at it was a, a the contract was related to a loan. However, banks can also interact between them indirectly, not through a contract, but through the fact that they have similar investments. And stress can propagate from a bank to another if they have uh, common assets in their, uh, in their investment portfolio. And that's because of price changes. So the idea here is that imagine that you have two banks for simplicity and that these two banks are investing in the same asset. If one bank um, is uh, under stress, the bank will may be forced to liquidate its investment portfolio or part of its investment portfolio. This liquidation process will cause a devaluation of the assets that are being sold uh, because of what is known as market impact. So whenever there is uh, someone is selling in the market, the price goes down. So if the price of the asset goes down, then this causes uh, a mark-to-market losses for the uh, sorry a mark-to-market loss for the other bank because the other bank is also investing in the same asset. So if the first bank goes into trouble, liquidates its portfolio, this causes a devaluation of the asset, which is also held by the second bank, and therefore the second bank. Uh, suffers a loss. Maybe the loss is, if the loss is big enough, then also the second bank might be forced to liquidate its uh, portfolio, and so on and so forth. So a fire sale, sorry, a mm, contagion here can occur, occur uh, because of the fact that banks uh, have similar assets in their uh, in their portfolios through uh, through a process of fire sales. So the model of uh, global cascades in uh, uh, in networks can be used to describe also or can be generalized to describe this type of processes um, of contagion due to overlapping portfolios. Now here the idea is that the uh, relationships between banks uh, will, uh, will be described by a, a bipartite network. The bipartite network um, has two types of nodes. One nodes are going to be investors or, or banks, for instance. The other types uh, type of nodes is going to represent assets. And uh, the network is bipartite because a connection can only a link can only connect a bank to an asset, an investor to an asset. And um, and whenever there is a link between the investor and the asset, it means that that asset is in the investment portfolio of the investor. The idea here is that, again, uh, a bank will default if it experiences a loss which is larger than its equity, 
then the uh, contagion occurs because when a bank defaults, the assumption is that its portfolio is liquidated in a fire sale, we, and this causes a devaluation of the asset. So, for instance, one could assume this change in the price, which is change in the log price, which is linear, uh, and it's proportional to uh, the fraction, the, the number of the shares or the volume of asset that is being uh, liquidated through a parameter eta, which represents the liquidity of the asset. And of course, there's a minus sign because we are considering the case of liquidation, so the, the price goes down. So that's a, 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 simple, uh, a simple market impact rule that can be used to, uh, to implement this idea of fire sales. There, there are other rules that can be used depending on, on different situations. This is um, just a simple, the simplest one. So, uh, well, the idea again is very similar. We have banks and assets, and uh, imagine that uh, we um, look at, at this bipartite network that represents the a pattern of uh, overlapping portfolios between banks in our system, and then imagine that a bank defaults at time zero. The default of the bank will cause uh, uh, the liquidation of its portfolio in a fire sale, which will imply the devaluation of the assets that are being liquidated, and therefore losses to other banks that are investing in those assets. This may cause some of these banks to default, default in turn, which will cause further fire sales, asset devaluations, and losses to other banks, and so on and so forth. So, as before, we have these... Uh, uh, this model for the propagation of distress between banks. Here, uh, shocks are propagated through market impact and price devaluation, so through the network of overlapping portfolios. So even if banks are not directly linked through a contract between them, they can still affect uh, one each other. So stress propagates, in this case, between banks with common assets. So again, one can look at Erdo Schreni, uh, well, say the bipartite version of Erdo Schreni networks, where we have N banks and M assets, and um, a link is present between a bank and an asset with a probability P. For each possible bank asset pair, the link is present with, with that uh, same probability. We assume, for instance, that all banks have the same size and leverage, which is equivalent to assuming that the, uh, the threshold uh, is the same for all banks in the case of, uh, uh, for all nodes in the case of uh, the model of global cascades. And again, we, ass we assume that each bank spreads its external assets uniformly across, uh, well, ac across the assets it it is investing in, not across its counterparties, but the assets in its portfolio. So it's a pre pretty much um, similar situation to the one we just described for the uh, interbank loans. It's just, uh, so it's a homogeneous system, Erdos Reni, but on a bipartite system. And of course, results are similar to the ones we have uh, just described. There is a non-monotonic non behavior of uh, the uh, probability of observing global cascades. By increasing diversification, we go from a regime where there is no uh, uh, no global there are no global cascades because banks are not interconnected or the portfolio of different banks do not overlap significantly. Then uh, connections start start being uh, present between several banks in the system, and so uh, global cascades can occur because a giant component exists. And then eventually banks become well diversified and therefore uh, the system is stable. There is again this robust yet fragile behavior in the sense that if we now look at the size of global cascades, this is a monotonic quantity and there is this regime close to the second phase transition which is here denoted by the vertical line in correspondence with uh, mu2 where um, as we approach this transition we have a small probability of observing cascades uh, global cascades, but then whenever contagion takes place, it, it will eventually affect the entire system, leading to the collapse of, uh, of the system. So we have this uh, 
ambivalent role of diversification as uh, we had in the previous case of interbank loans. So the model is pretty much the same. It, it's different because the dynamic uh, contains this price devaluation, but the, uh, the main ingredient is again this, this, the existence of this threshold. So leverage can be increased also in this case, leading to uh, an increased instability. So this model can be uh, also understood in terms of a branching process. So the idea of uh, a branching, pro analytically understood in terms of a branching process. So we, I want here to sketch the, the main idea. The idea of a branching process is that uh, uh, we have, um, so the, the branching processes were introduced by um, Galton and Watson to study the problem of the um, survival of family names. So the idea is that there's one ancestor and then there is a random process through which this ancestor generates x offspring, where x is a random variable, then each offspring in turn generates other offspring, and so on and so forth. And the question is whether the species or the uh, family name will survive at uh, forever. So whether there is a non-zero probability for these species to survive at a long time, in the limit of infinite times. So the result, the fundamental result, is that the, uh, the species survives with non-zero probability if the expected number of offspring per, uh, per node is larger than one. If it's smaller than one, then the process will uh, eventually die out exponentially. So in our case, we have something similar. So instead of having one ancestor and its offspring, we have one bank that goes bankrupt, that causes other banks to fail, because of their um, overlapping portfolios, and then each new failure can cause other failures, and so on and so forth. So the idea somehow is that global cascades should occur with non-zero probability if the expected number of defaults that are triggered by uh, one bank defaulting is larger than one. It is actually a little bit more complicated uh, because uh, uh, banks or nodes have some uh, uh, some different features. So what we have to do is to uh, compute. What we can do is to compute a transition matrix uh, where the element B i j uh, is the probability that bank i fails given the default of bank j at the previous iteration. So is the default of bank j enough to trigger the default of bank i? Uh, and what's the probability that this happens? So this probability is expressed in this, uh, uh, well, in this, uh, in this formula. Well, very briefly, we sum over all assets, the number of assets owned by bank I, so, so the number of shares owned by bank I of asset A, times the initial price of asset A, times the devaluation. So this factor 1 minus FA QJA is the devaluation in, us, in the value, in the price of asset A, which is induced by the fact that bank J, which has just defaulted, is liquidating its, its shares in asset A. So this is a number uh, which the 1 minus FA uh, of QJA is the... Uh, percentage change in the value of the asset, which is due to the fact that bank J is selling the asset in a fire sale. So basically this uh, um, sum over the assets, sum over A from 1 to M, represents the loss experienced by bank I because of the failure of bank J, because of the failure of bank J only. So if this loss is larger than the equity, then the bank defaults. If the loss is more than the equity, then the bank survives. And we are computing the probability that this happens. So in the case of, uh, for instance, the Erdos Schreni uh, random network, what we can compute is actually the uh, different metrics. Um, also, the metrics P would be, uh, would be good. 
uh, a different matrix representing uh, the um, so whose element n h k would represent the number of banks of degree h that fail because of the failure of a bank of degree k. So we basically can aggregate over uh, classes of degrees if we consider um, uncorrelated networks. So uh, that's what the matrix N uh, represents. And um, so here P of H k given A would be the probability that uh, a node with degree, uh, sorry, a bank with degree k is connected with a bank with degree H through asset A, and then F would represent the uh, probability that the bank with degree H fails because of the failure of a bank with degree K that is connected to it through asset A. So it's just a, a, some aggregate version for classes, classes of degrees of the previous, uh, of the previous, previous operator. So uh, the um, fundamental uh, theorem of branching processes that we uh, we discussed in the previous slides now translates into uh, so instead of computing the expected number of new failures triggered by uh, each node we just have to compute the largest eigenvalue of this matrix b or equivalently this matrix n for the case of uh, uncorrelated networks so if the largest eigenvalue is larger than 1, then it means that the system will uh, amplify shocks. Uh, if the largest eigenvalue is smaller than 1, instead the system will not uh, amplify shocks, but will be able to sustain the, uh, the exogenous shock. So this is a phase diagram as a function of leverage and diversification. Uh, and uh, the ratio between the number of assets and the number of uh, of uh, sorry the number of banks and the number of assets and again one can discriminate between a stable and an unstable region and this um, phase diagram reflects more or less what we have seen before uh, in the uh, when we were plotting the probability of observing a default as a function of the average degree of diversification for different values of the leverage. So we see the, the non-monotonicity, so the existence of a regime of uh, low diversification where no cascades occur, of a regime of large enough diversification where no cascades occur, and of an intermediate regime where cascades do occur. We also see that there is a minimum value of leverage below which the system is always stable. Uh, keep in mind that leverage, for instance, is uh, something that for uh, regulated uh, institutions is uh, is fixed by the, the maximum leverage is fixed by uh, by the regulation, for instance, through through the Basel uh, Accords. So that's something that could be uh, could be implemented by by a policymaker. Uh, and this is essentially the existence of this critical value of leverage below which the system is always stable is reminiscent. It's the same uh, feature that we saw in the uh, model of uh, Duncan Watts, where we observed that there was a uh, critical value of the threshold phi above which the system were, was never displaying global cascades. So phi is related to 1 over lambda. So. Uh, so it's essentially the same feature here. But the interpretation is now in terms of leverage, so the amount of borrowing that is going on in the, in the system. We have discussed how the uh, linear threshold model of global cascades on networks can be applied to the study of uh, contagion in interbank systems. So uh, it is essentially contagion in interbank systems. It's a... Uh, version of the uh, of the model we discussed in the first lecture which is um, it's a version of the model on directed weighted networks so it can be solved with the same techniques uh, as as we uh, as we that we used in the first lecture and the 
this model therefore is useful also to build some intuition about how parameters such as leverage or diversification can impact systemic risk in, uh, in the banking system. So in particular, an interesting, uh, an interesting thought is the, uh, that comes out of this analysis is the fact that there is a tension between individual risk and systemic risk. We, 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 we have observed this, for instance, in the case of diversification. So diversification is always good from the point of view of an individual investor uh, which is isolated. But when uh, we take into account interactions, so the fact that the, the, uh, the investor is not isolated but is connected with others, so increasing diversification also means increasing the uh, uh, connectivity in the system, so increasing the pathways through which stress can propagate into the system. So therefore, uh, it can increase systemic risk. And we've seen, for instance, this non-monotonicity of, um, of the contagion probability and the existence of this uh, robust yet fragile regime, uh, where we have a small probability of observing large cascades, but a large size of the cascade uh, whenever uh, a cascade take, whenever contagion kicks in. So these are a couple of references uh, related to the specific uh, papers we consider, the one on uh, uh, contagion in financial networks due to counterparty risk and another on uh, contagion in financial networks due to overlapping portfolios.